foods are captured or cultured in rivers and lakes in the ocean. And they include fish and invertebrates, algae and aquatic plants. They're a wonderful source of locally produced nutrition for millions of people. And if sustainably managed, have huge potential to feed so many more. Friends of Ocean Action and our colleagues have identified many opportunities and challenges for blue food systems. Those involved in the robust scientific exercise of the blue food assessment are demonstrating the rich contribution blue foods can and do make to just and sustainable support for healthy diets around the world. Integral to these blue food opportunities is the call for innovation to maximize the nutritional benefits these foods provide for the communities which rely on them. The call is for innovation to focus on supporting local economies, taking gender transformative approaches with environmental sustainability as the ruling principle. Good day. Welcome to this panel session, which is coming at the beginning of the Food Systems Summit Dialogues on food from the ocean, rivers and lakes, essential for our food systems. We're very, very pleased indeed that you've been able to join us, but perhaps I should say we're even more pleased to be joined by some extraordinary uh, experts to help us organize our thinking and adjust our, our mindsets in advance of the dialogue. And it's a kind of very exciting because as well as being part of the virtual ocean dialogues that we're doing in connection with the Food Systems Summit, we're also connecting with the Friends of Ocean Action at the World Economic Forum. And all together, we are part of the build-up towards the United Nations Secretary General's Food Systems Summit that's taking place in September this year. Now, part of the preparation for this summit is intensive multi-stakeholder engagement through structured dialogue. Dialogue that ensures that everybody who wishes has a chance to be engaged 
in thinking through the issues that are key to the future of food systems. And the theme for this panel and for the dialogue that's going to follow it is focusing on food from the ocean, rivers and lakes, or aquatic food, which is so essential for the future of all food systems everywhere. And here is the destination that we would like you to have in mind as you engage with this panel and then in the dialogues. Where do we want to be by 2030? Here's what we propose. By 2030, aquatic food is a fundamental element of global food security. Policies and investments are in place to ensure sustainable management of aquatic food resources. This is done with minimal impacts from climate change and from land-based activities. So our panel is going to help us to find the way to making sure that aquatic food production is done in a way that is good for the people of our planet and for the planet herself. And without more ado, I would like to go straight into our panel. And I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Minister Ina Eriksson Soraide is here from the government of Norway, where she is Minister for Foreign Affairs. And in welcoming Minister Saraidi to open up our panel, I want to stress to all of you that Norway has been spearheading efforts to promote the role of aquatic foods as part of sustainable food systems, while also leading efforts to protect the ocean. And I'd love it, Minister Ina, if you could just help us a bit. We're giving us three minutes or so on how you believe that governments can help to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development through food systems that are good for the ocean, good for climate, and good for people. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you so much, David. And uh, of course, it is a question and a topic that could easily demand more than three minutes, but I'll try to be as brief as I can. And just to start out by the most obvious part of this answer. Um, as many of you know, my Prime Minister, Anna Sulbaev, she initiated and is also leading the high-level panel on sustainable ocean economy. And I've been very amazed to see the engagement from heads of states and government all over the world, engaging and actually reaching a consensus on uh, sustainable ocean development to make sure that we can harvest both the food and also take care of environmental issues, in addition to actually using the oceans also as a way of economic growth. But it needs to be balanced. And that's my maybe my main point uh, in this introduction, that unless we manage the oceans sustainably, we will not be able to harness any of the goods that we are going to talk about for, for the next uh, minutes uh, here. And if we are to reach the SDGs, I think we all know that we have to think a little bit new on how to, for instance, be able to eradicate hunger. And when you look into what could potentially be game changers, um, in my opinion, uh, making use of the resources uh, in the oceans, the lakes and the rivers is probably the most, um, I would say, promising game changer we can have. We, we only have less than nine years left to reach these goals. At the same time, I think it is an undercommunicated message that we can actually make use of the oceans in a sustainable way, whereas we can have more food, more nutritious food. We can take care of the uh, state of the ocean's health, but we can also use it as a way of, as I mentioned, boosting also um, our economy. One of the things I find quite fascinating when we discuss food, food security and, and eradicating poverty 
is that very often when we talk about the blue sector, so to speak, we talk about the economic development. When we talk about food and food security, we very easily turn to agriculture, which of course is extremely important. But at the same time, I think we're missing out on very important um, way of reaching these SDGs. Of course, the governments um, in, in question here also need to abide by what the ocean panel has been talking about, comprehensive sustainable ocean plans. Unless we are able to sustainably manage the oceans, we will not be able to harvest from them in any way uh, that is sustainable over time. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that not only did the panel uh, submit its recommendations with full consensus uh, on December 3rd last year, it has also created what I would call a huge momentum in the way we th talk about how to make use of the oceans for different, um, different ends. I've also been quite pleased to see that the engagement from countries not taking part in the ocean panel as of now uh, is also very strong. They want to either link up or they want to make use of the recommendations. And we can talk later on about some of the more uh, detailed uh, issues. I just wanted to, uh, to give this overview right now. But my main message is actually to fully integrate aquatic uh, food into food systems in a sustainable way. It is possible. I think the high-level panel has, in a way, made the pathway to this. And, and it is absolutely possible to have these, uh, these plants as well on sustainable ocean. Uh, and that is how I think we can, uh, can manage. So I'm very optimistic about this and, and very hopeful that if, if we all now turn our attention to the use of aquatic food, we can actually manage to, to use the oceans as a game changer. Brilliant. Oceans can be a game changer for food systems everywhere, but their resource has to be properly managed and that calls for integrated action between nations. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. We'll go more into that. Thank you so much, Minister Ina, for setting us up so well. And this is a wonderful segue to hearing now from Dr. Shakuntala Tilstead. Uh, Dr. Tilstead actually works for World Fish. And in her, her working there, she uh, has done such a lot of work uh, uh, contributions over the last few years. And you know, you may not all realize this, but she's just been announced as the World Food Prize winner for 2021. And it really is wonderful news, having seen your incredible contributions over the years. You're also vice chair of one of the action tracks for the uh, uh, food system summit the one that's working on advancing equitable livelihoods so could you possibly give us uh, three minutes on how best to build on the opportunities which aquatic food systems offer to advance livelihoods generally but particularly the livelihoods of women you have the floor thank you so much well 800 million people depend directly on aquatic food systems. And most of these people are found in low and middle income countries. And about 50% of them are women who are involved in primary and secondary systems, production systems, such as mending nets, cleaning, drying aquatic foods, gleaning, and many times in unpaid services. We do know that even though I've given a, a, a figure of 800 million and saying 50% are women, we do know that these figures can be grossly underestimated and that many women are invisible and they are not captured in the data. Very often, these women have no direct access to the income they generate, and they also have very little to say in respect to decision-making, either in the 
in the aquatic food systems or even in their homes. And we know that they are easily displaced by shocks and disruptions, as we can see now evidenced by the COVID-19 pandemic. Data is showing us that more women, that a greater proportion of women are becoming jobless and it's getting, and it's harder for them to regain their jobs than it is for men. How can we build on the opportunities that aquatic food systems offer? And the first thing I want to I want to talk about is making uh, getting data so that we can make women more visible in all parts of the food systems, from production through the supply chains and in consumption. Secondly, we should operationalize the frameworks that we have. We need policy recommendations and investments to be gender sensitive. And they must be reflected in various frameworks, such as the financial infrastructure and instruments that we have, that we can put to use, microcredits, insurance, and targeted investments. And we should pay attention to women-led cooperatives and community support groups. We have seen that now in COVID-19 responses that these cooperatives and women-led groups play an important role. The next point I want to raise is that we should invest and create platforms and opportunities for women to take active part in education, research, innovation, and developing solutions and policy recommendations that are centered on aquatic food systems. As David mentioned, I am the Vice Chair of Action Track 4, and I do think it is my responsibility to make sure that the voices of these women are heard and that these women are not visible, that they are seen. And they're engaged, not only in telling their stories about their roles within aquatic food systems, but in designing the solutions we need to transport the, the food systems with aquatic foods. Thank you. Big thanks to you. And uh, the message that I received so strongly from your words is it's not just enough to invite women to come in and tell their story, what's needed is to make sure that they have agency and are able to be active in the design and implementation of aquatic food solutions. Uh, that then will be immensely transformative and empowering. Thank you for being so clear and precise in your remarks and look forward to more conversation. Now, when Shakuntala was talking, she mentioned about the importance of investment in women-led action on aquatic foods. And so our next panelist is Sanjeev Krishnan. He's managing director of S2G Ventures, which focuses on investment in different agriculture and food system issues. So Sanjeev, how can private sector investments help to create and sustain holistic food systems that are good for the ocean, good for the climate, and good for people. Thank you, David, and thank you for having me. Um, I think one is one, one of the most exciting parts of innovation today globally is in the food system. Um, it's a, been a $5 trillion sector, the largest employer in the world, and the consumer is fundamentally changing it, voting with their pocketbooks or in sustainability and health. 44% of the global population is either millennial and Gen Z, and they're eating differently, and it's having real impact. Uh, top 100 brands in food, 90 are losing share. In the U.S., there's 65 categories in our grocery store, 62 of them, uh, and 62 of them, the incumbent is losing share. So there's a revolution underway from a consumer perspective that I think is really changing the overall food system. I think increasingly will change the ocean system as well. One of the things that's happening, though, to pair with what's happening on the consumer side is a real revolution in innovation. The biology, chemistry, physics, and importantly, the computation of our food system is fundamentally changing. And I think venture capital has increasingly focused on this sector. There's been a nearly 10x increase in investments um, around innovation in the food system. 
We think that same focus around innovation should happen in the ocean sector. One focus on sort of ecosystem resiliency, resource optimization, and more consumer consumer centric approaches to really changing the ocean system around you know aquatic food. And we think we're just at the start of this revolution. So really focus on data and technology, restoration and protection. And then when it comes to resource optimization, really new inputs that can make it more sustainable as well as new production methodologies as well. And then importantly, I think it's important to bring the consumer on this journey, really focus on sort of consumer, new consumer facing products, as well as supply chain solutions that offer traceability um, solutions as well. So I think we're very dedicated to it. We have over a billion dollars committed to a new food system revolution. We're probably one of the largest funds focused on the ocean sector um, and really trying to catalyze other capital into this space. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Uh, as you were talking, I was just really struck by what you referred to as a consumer-led revolution in food that is going to actually apply very much to what's happening in the ocean with a potential 10 scale increase in investment uh, happening and uh, a, an ocean sector, as you put it, that really is fit for purpose. And I just want to ask you in just a, uh, half a minute, is it gonna happen? I think it, it's already happening. Um, we've already seen since the launch of our Oceans Fund um, about 10 to 15 other funds and groups wanting to invest in this space. Um, I think if you look at um, overall venture capital associated with the food system overall, it's, it's increasingly going to um, be focused on sort of not just land-based, but ocean-based as well. The other thing that gives me a lot of hope post-COVID, uh, investments focused on ESG has grown dramatically. Um, it was around 800 billion in the public markets prior to COVID. That number today is around 2.4 trillion. And I think it's going to be focused on three transitions, the energy transition, the food system transition, and we think in the ocean transition space as well, really around um, the SDG goals, around net zero as well. Very good. Oh, so that's remarkably uh, good news, Sanjeev. And everybody, I mean, COVID is changing how we think and how we act it, it has to it's such an enormous ongoing stress in so many places and i'm really interested when both sanjeev and shankotala are, are, are very clear about the fact that things are feeling different as we work through covid and so i now come to ambassador peter Thompson, United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. And uh, in addition, uh, he used to be permanent uh, representative of Fiji uh, uh, to the United Nations when I was there. Uh, he's a Fijian diplomat indeed, uh, and I'm super grateful to him for his consistent advocacy and, I believe, effective interventions. So, Peter, the ocean is crucial to achieving many of the sustainable development goals, actually going beyond SDG 14 even. So why is the ocean so important, particularly in terms of food systems? And indeed, why do we need to look after this ocean and pre prevent our food systems actually from damaging it as well? Peter, you have the floor. Thanks very much, David. Uh, can I just say thank you to Sanjeev? Man. Uh, that was just the best news I've heard for weeks, I can tell you. Uh, everything that you said, 100% agree with. You didn't and, know. Uh, you didn't know. You heard for the first time today. Brilliant. Well, no, they're all they're ideas which I talk about uh, pretty much every day in forums around the world to youth and old people, but I often get people looking at me thinking that, you know, I'm living on another planet. So Sanjeev, thank you. 100% agree with everything you said. Look, on SDG 14 is the one thing that binds us all, right? This is universally agreed to. Humankind is dedicated to SDG 14 since 2015. Conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. When you get down to it, at its heart is the sustainable blue economy. And I emphasize sustainable. This is not about another round of linear exploitation of finite planetary resources. This is about a relationship with the blue economy, which is fully sustainable. And anything that is not sustainable should not be contemplated or funded. 
So that's that's what the sustainable blue economy is. And that, of course, the relationship to food in the sustainable blue economy is very, very strong. Uh, and it, it's not just about aquaculture, which I'll speak about. But it's about fisheries itself. Um, we have to make sure that um, we are managing our fisheries properly. As you know, uh, something like 24% of uh, fish stocks are, uh, are overfished. That's an FAO statistic, and that's remaining pretty constant. Uh, but um, we're making progress there. I mean, th there's, um, the FAO has this thing called the Port States Measures Agreement, which is designed to stop illegal and unregulated, unreported fishing. It's the only international binding instrument we have in this regard. And that, uh, that's increasingly being signed on to. I think there's around about 100 countries now have signed on. So we've got that going for us. We've got RFMOs covering all the, the important fisheries of the world. And some are underperforming. We've just got to strengthen those. Management is the best form of conservation. That is the FAO maxim. So that's on fisheries. But on aquaculture, you know, world fisheries, uh, wild catch has been pretty steady now for decades at one level. But aquaculture is just going through the roof uh, and has a fantastic future ahead of us. But it, it's got to be a, a sustainable aquaculture. It's got to be aquaculture which is not damaging the environment. Uh, and, you know, I can see I've just about run out of time, but I'd love to talk during our discussion period a bit more about aquaculture. Because when I think about food systems, I do think of that as being an integral part of feeding the billions it will be who will need uh, protein in the future when we start having problems on land. Thank you, David. That, that is super important, Peter. Beautifully, beautifully said that uh, really the world will need um, food from aquatic sources in order to meet demand. And, and I think that's clear. But your point that uh, I'm sure all would agree with, and I noticed some nodding, is it's got to be a sustainable relationship with the ocean not, as you say, a linear exploitative one. And just that switch, which is happening now, and Sanjeev is clearly quite into it because he sees that there is this is a reasonable place for investing as well. But, but we've got to just let that come up. And as you say, you've got to manage the ocean for sustainability. And that then leads me to move on to our next uh, opening remark from uh, our other panelist, Dr. Agnes Calabata, Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General for the forthcoming Food Systems Summit. And uh, perhaps the only other comment I'd like to make is that I've learned from Dr. Calabata the value and the potential impact of a fully integrated approach to thinking about food systems and one which engages all the stakeholders fully in its operation. Dr. Calabata, you have the floor. Thank you, David. And uh, let me start by thanking you all. I mean, everybody here on this is a partner in the food system. Thank you, Peter, <coughs> for the work we've done together coming up with this, these meetings and Shakuntara, thank you and congratulations. And Honorable Minister, the first time I saw a food system strategy. It was an Norwegian food system strategy. So you've definitely been at work trying to think ahead of the curve with regards to food system. Now, the way this comes together from, from where I'm sitting from a food systems perspective, we've looked at two things. We are looking at how we ensure that there's a conversation that is happening at country level that allows countries to think through the challenges they have, they have but also the opportunities for solutions. Remembering fully well that the Food System Summit was, was launched because the Secretary General recognized that it touches all the 17 SDGs. Peter has just called out 14, uh, SDG 14 but also recognizing that, that we are, it's happening at a time when we can't afford excesses in our food system. We're impacting our planet, we're impacting our food system. So we've put in place dialogues being led by David. The dialogues are to ensure that we have discussions around these challenges. Norway is producing, is one of the top 10 countries in aquatic food production. How is the industry managing waste? How is the industry managing sustainable fishing? Because
because we know that 35% of the fishing out there is not sustainable. Who do you need around the table? Are you enough as Ministry of Agriculture? Do you need a number of ministries to work with you? Do you need Scandinavian countries to come around the table with you to ensure that you're having a regional dialogue that addresses those problems? That's part of what the food system is addressing. The second piece is the, what is happening in action trucks. Shakuntara is in one of the action trucks. In action trucks, we are part of, we are tr trying to create a situation where we are identifying solutions that could make a difference in different parts of the world, depending on the challenges they are facing. So for example, the, the small island nations have put forward an action truck that talks about climate proofing, um, uh, the fishing, uh, the, the fishing ecosystem around the islands. The action, one of the other action trucks has come about a living wedge within um, the, value, the the food system value chains, including fisheries value chain. Because in the fisheries value chain, we employ about fifty percent women across the value chain, but they earn less than the men. And Shakuntala mentioned this. So these are some of the things that are beginning to come out. People are actually looking at real solutions. We took this out, ensured that people like Shakuntara that come from research and other people she's working with are contributing and complementing the efforts and voices that are coming from government so that when we come together, it's member states talking about what they've learned and what they're doing, but it's also us from academia, from science, from business that like you just had our colleague uh, Shanjev talking about talking about the opportunities, but also extremely aware of the challenges of our food system that we can no longer afford not to talk about and not to address. So I'll stop there for now, David, due to the time constraint, and we can yeah. talk about this. Well, but thank you for highlighting in your remarks that actually, the, although the challenges are complex, they can be addressed. There are solutions coming forth now and particularly in the area of the ocean and aquatic food there is such a lot to build on and as you say this is a real concern to national governments all over the world we're hearing it more and more and so i'd like to go back to our panelists and just invite them to open their mics if they feel like it and just react to what each other have said I'd, first of all if it's okay I'd like to invite minister Ina. there's been a lot of, of, of good plaudits for, for norway and what, what's happening in your leadership but i'd love to know what your magic wand would be what would you really want this all to lead to uh, as we move forward and how do you react to what you've heard from the other panel well david i i can i have to disappoint you to say that i don't have a magic wand but i have a couple oh. of ideas that i think can can be useful uh, in this regard and i think one of them um alludes to the point that many have been making and that is the necessity of um international cooperation and cooperation among nations um one of the things that we have seen over years and i think we've done this now for decades is that we are trying to help uh, many countries and many coastal states in managing their fisheries and also mapping their resources in order to make them make it p possible to to manage them sustainably and wisely but what we have learned over time and we are we are at, at the moment i think helping out some 30 32 countries uh, ma by making use of development programs and also a research vessel that that helps to map um, the resources what we have seen is that much of this work uh, will not bear fruits unless there is a real cooperation, for instance, among neighboring states. So what we're trying to do is also to use our own experience from uh, having a cooperation with Russia on joint management on our fishery stocks in the Barents Sea. And I very often refer to this uh, story because I think it, it's a good way of illustrating my point. Back in the early 80s, the Arctic cod stock was almost extinct. Uh, what we did was, together with Russia, enter into a very, um, I would say, precise and knowledge-based management. So we have a joint fisheries commission working very well on a daily basis. What we experience today is that the Arctic cod stock is maybe the most healthy cod stock wow. in the world. 
and it generates an income of around $1.2 billion a year on each side, both for Norway and Russia. So my point is to, to have um, a knowledge-based approach to work with countries to make them cooperate on uh, this management is maybe one of the best investments we can do in order to assure, I would say, the goal that we talked about in the beginning, how to make aquatic food systems an integral yeah. part of our thinking for eradicating hunger and poverty. And, and yeah. as Peter and other uh, alluded to, this is really what can change the whole calculus and the whole narrative if we use it sustainably and if we use it, and if we do this in a in a coordinated and joint way. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. I love the example, and that gives us all a lot of hope. But I want to invite uh, Dr. Thilsed, Jack Shakuntala, if you wouldn't mind, just how do you want us to advance this agenda in as much as we can? in ensuring in ways that ensure that actually poorer people and particularly poorer women do get their share of the benefits and it doesn't all go to somewhere else that, and they don't see anything of it. Thank you, David. Um, first of all, the first point I want to make is so many have made before that the food systems transformation must take into account both land and water systems. And if we look when much of, much of the debate and much of the narrative starts with what's going wrong. But if we would look at uh, uh, aquatic food systems, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, in, in South and Southeast Asia, there are much, many um, results and many stories which are positive and which all belong within the framework of small-scale fisheries and small-scale aquaculture. And we have to build on these solutions. And we must take into consideration that much of the people who depend on on aquatic foods. It's not just the oceans, but it's also inland waters. If you just take the wetlands, which are seasonal, um, seasonal water bodies, that's where much of the people work, and many of the people work, and much of the food comes from. And again, we come back to the story that the data we have is so poor, and it does not reflect the reality of the poor and the vulnerable who depend on these systems for livelihoods, for income, and for food and nutrition. So I will go back to the point about where about data, um, perhaps it's because I work with research, but we, 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 when we don't have the data, then the problems become invisible. Then to get the solutions, again, I would go back to going back to these communities who are managing these systems and who rely on these systems. And we must look at the, their, their traditional ways, the ways they have done it, the ways that the solutions have evolved and learn from them. And we now have very good technologies that we can blend with traditional knowledge. We have all the data technology to, to, to be able to blend and find solutions find them quickly because as, as we all are saying we have nine years to the to, to meeting the sustainable development goals we can find them quickly and we can find solutions that work in this specific context much of when people talk about uh, about solutions, many talk about scaling. Yes, scaling is important, but first and foremost, they must be context specific. Thank you. Hey, that was really important too. All my work on systems change says to me says to me systems have to be looked at in their context. Otherwise, you get it wrong. 
and that's super important when it comes to this concept of uh, scaling. Thank you very much indeed. There were many, many things that you said just then that I think we all need to hold. Data, knowledge, learning, blending. Sanjeev, when you hear us talk about some of the complexities in uh, food systems, in development more generally, does that give you a sort of headache a bit because you're thinking I need to bring investors into this and this is sounding a bit too complex or do you believe that investors are prepared to come alongside us and listen to the analysis about the social and economic determinants of some of these things? No, I think for capitalism to have social license in the 21st century, we have to. A business has to be part of this theory of change. I mean, you look at, um, you know, our relationship with complex adaptive systems overall, i.e. nature. You look at the energy system. Um, we went from really a focus on sort of perhaps hydrocarbon and more extractive to now there's a revolution underway in renewables. Um, majority of new baseload in the U.S. are increasingly renewables. And I think this has happened globally. Um, and I think similarly, the food system, whether it's the soil systems from you know focusing on soil health or the ocean system focusing on ocean health, this is sort of, in our view, the future. And it's, you know, we have two or three theories of change. One is the consumer. Um, they're the most powerful force in the world. Two is, I, I, I'm a big believer, there's very few silver bullets, but one of them is data. Uh, we need to go from a data-poor environment, whether it's soil-based or ocean-based, to a more data-rich environment. That has huge implications around the second and third order of variables we could do with that data. From new fintech solutions, new, new production solutions, new um, regu regulatory solutions that could help kind of manage these public goods that we need to, to maintain for our own um, you know, livelihood. So I think overall, I'm very you know, um, optimistic that businesses' relationship to these complex adaptive systems can change. I mean, we've seen this in the energy system, and I think we need to port that view to, to a more circular food system and a circular ocean system. And I think there's money to be made, and investors have seen that you can create wealth, um, jobs, um, and most importantly, you know, impact on the ground. Wow, thank you very much indeed. As you were talking, I was thinking, well, uh, Minister Ina has told, to us, told us about the importance of national governments and those in charge of jurisdictions taking responsibility. And Shakuntala has said, but you know, that the people are a key part of all this and we must consider them fully. And then you said, uh, yes, and it can grow if we've got the data. And then you also said that business can manage this kind of complexity. And that brings me to Peter. Peter, the real excitement that you hinted at is on uh, uh, aquaculture, uh, particularly, in, in, you know, inland freshwater, because you see this as a real launch point. And I'd just love you to just spend a couple of minutes just going to the extreme. Where do you think things can be by 2030 if we really manage to understand the power of the aquatic food resource? Uh, let me talk about sort of a business as usual scenario. Um, and under business as usual, there's absolutely no reason why we can't have exponential growth in aquaculture, let's say for the African continent. Now, Asia's doing pretty well, especially East Asia on aquaculture, but Africa is very, um, let's say, the potential is just vast in Africa. I think Nigeria and Egypt are, uh, have done pretty well. But for sub-Saharan Africa, this is a huge nutritional uh, future. Uh, and uh, this was recognized at the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in uh, Nairobi in uh, about two years ago. Uh, so there's, there's going to be big development of aquaculture. As I say, business as usual. We're not talking about salmon farming and fjords, Minister. This is going to be more about, uh, you know, things like catfish, uh, and tilapia and so on. A lot of it will be inland, uh, and but there will also be coastal and mariculture. So that's business as usual. But I, I want you to think about, David, I want you to think about the fact that food is fashion. What we eat today is not what our parents ate and certainly not what our grandparents ate. I'll give you a practical example. I opened the Fiji embassy in, in Tokyo in the early 1980s and first discovered sushi. At that stage, sushi was only eaten in Japan. Uh, then a revolution took place in the late 1980s. Now from the Congo to Alaska, you can uh, find sushi shops, right? But that happened within a space of a few decades. So 
you know, which was good for the ocean and it was bad for the ocean. It was bad for tuna sustainability, but it was great for seaweed production, for example. But anyway, my point being that food is fashion, and that's why I was so excited by what Sanjeev was saying and why he and I got to talk some more about this changing food consumption uh, because people have got to eat sustainably. We can't do what we were doing before. You know, that's why my wife and I gave up beef when we were living in New York. We read too many reports about what beef was doing to the planet. And we love our grandchildren more than we love beef. So goodbye hamburgers for us, right? That's worked out very nicely for us. Thank you. But I want to leave you with one other thought in terms of expanding your consciousness about what you're eating and where food is going in terms of fashion. I've been doing a bit of work recently with, uh, on the subject of cellular aquaculture, Cellular aquaculture, you've heard about beef being grown where you just take a cell from a living cow and you can produce, you know, a million hamburgers from that. Well, the same can be done with fish and is being done with fish where you create from one cell of a living yellowfin tuna and release it back into the wild. You take that one cell and you make as many beautiful, glistening, plate-ready tuna steaks as you want. Uh, and there's, you know, there's no growing of guts and gills and fins and, 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 and there's no threat to the wild stock uh, sustainability of that yellowfin tuna. Uh, okay, what's the problem? Why are we all doing this right now? Obviously cost, but you, know, you scale it, you get it up there and, uh, and it, it can be more than just food for the rich man's plate. You know, you take the scale and you get the products right, maybe nuggets or whatever, and you could feed the world with cellular aquaculture and leave nature to itself. Mm. Anyway, that's what I'm saying. Just let's open our minds a bit as we approach this whole area of waste and, and future production and changing fashions in food. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. I kind of hearing a very strong undercurrent in the discussion so far therefore about the importance of the consumer being a conscious consumer and being able to shift in a way the whole shape of the the, the sector the absolute need to manage resources which uh, are needing to be looked after so that the whole circular economy is sustained the, the importance of recognizing complexity and the desirability of constantly engaging women and poor people in the process and then governments have to be there and if governments aren't there as we heard from the minister it won't work so those are the things that i have heard but i'd like now to give the last word to dr agnes calabata our special envoy what have you heard, Dr. Calabata, and what would you like people to be thinking as they move in to their dialogues that they're about to have? Thank you, David, and, and thank you for accepting to do the dialogues with us. It really makes a whole lot of difference. I mean, I've had a number of issues, uh, and, and I feel like our job, my job and your job, is to create awareness of the issues, is to make sure that member states understand what is at stake, that consumers understand their place and role, like Sanjay has called out. Uh, uh, you know, I've always talked about how we eat, <laughs> eat three times a day. If those three times is fish, so great for our health. But we also need to understand that it really makes a whole lot of difference in our world and impacting our world. <clears throat> what the summit is doing is creating an opportunity for solutions to come out that can make a difference in people's lives and through action tracks. And those are also coming out. For example, as, as you're saying, Peter, Africa has an opportunity to grow its aquaculture by 50% in the next just 10 years alone. There's so much capacity that is not being utilized and can make a whole lot of difference in people's lives. So those solutions are very critical and are coming through the Food System Summit. We are providing space for these dialogues. We are providing opportunity for everybody's voice to be heard and we want to be heard. We are making sure, we will make sure that in the Food System Summit, there's no voice that is locked out. Sometimes we don't agree and many times we'll not agree, but it's not a reason for any voice not to be heard. So sometimes we don't trust each other, but this is the opportunity to dialogue and be able to bring out areas where we don't trust each other. Now, the last point I want to make is, whatever we do, the change that we want to see will only come and will only happen based on the actions that we will take 
as we go towards 2030, recognizing what's at stake, but also based on the commitment we put on the table, but also based on the type of policy frameworks our governments will put in place. And lastly, the pressure we put on them to, 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 to put these changes in place. Again, we've built this as a people's summit so that people can help governments ensure that we are being accountable to our planet. We've put this as, we've put young people at the center of this summit. So if you start hearing so many voices of young people talking about food systems, and I like uh, you, what you're saying, Peter, around food is fashion, you're going to hear a lot of, of that. This, it's because we are encouraging and engaging young people around this, mostly because we know the future is, belongs to them. And what we are doing is not right for the future of our continent. So I really encourage you to be part of these dialogues, to listen, but from a leadership perspective, where we are as leaders, let's hear what we need to be doing differently to move this world forward from coming through SDGs, but also from sustaining our planet. So thank you for the opportunity for this dialogue to happen and to bring together the, the oceans and the, the ter terrestrial food systems. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kalibar. To everybody, the, the dialogues start now. Our global dialogue on food from the ocean, rivers and lakes. And really pleased that you're all participating. And can I, on behalf of all of you, thank our opening panellists for their wonderful orientation, getting us really fired up for this event. Minister Ina eriksson Saradi, thank you very much indeed, Foreign Minister of Norway. Uh, Dr. Shakuntala Tilstead from World Fish, uh, uh, thank you indeed for your comments and congratulations again on your World Food Prize. Uh, Sanjeev Krishnan, Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer of S2G Ventures, thank you for really setting us on fire today. Peter Thompson, United Nations Secretary General, Special Envoy for the Oceans, Peter Lotion, you never disappoint Peter, thank you. And then Dr. Agnes Kalabata, our leader for the summit, thank you for those very, very helpful summarising comments. Uh, again, grateful to all of you and grateful to the World Economic Forum for facilitating the development of this panel. Uh, see you soon.